Hey, thanks so much, Howard, and uh, thanks so much to each one of you that have been watching the series. I have so enjoyed sharing this stuff with you. And uh, we're now getting to the time where we really started to build our faith and uh, how does faith work. And I'm super excited about what we're going to be sharing just now. Um, the title of this one is obviously Uncorrupted Faith 7, I think it is. And we're looking at the people of faith. And I want to start up to look at how people can actually have a gift of faith that can activate things in each one of us and can help us to just step into the much more. So let's dig in together. And maybe I was just thinking as I was preparing for today, for the session, you know, about a person that impacted me in a powerful way. And as I'm sharing this story, I'm sure each one of you will, will can think of at least one person that's done this. I think I was about 20, 21 years of age, and uh, I met a young lady called Melani de Toy. Many of you now know her as uh, she really functions as a prophetess uh, into the nations as part of our 412 partnership of churches and has been an incredible gift to so many of us. But I knew her when she was a lot younger and um, met her then and we became good friends. And it was a strange thing for me because just being with her felt like it did something in me. Uh, she was very sharp prophetically from the day that I met her. And uh, she just seemed to, and I say prophetically sharp, she seemed to have an ability to just hear what it is that the Lord you know, was seeing uh, or wanting to say into a situation. And so even, you know, the Bible says the secrets of our hearts are laid bare before the prophetic. And when I would spend time with her, it was like she could see the secrets of men's hearts. And it was fascinating. But I, what I found was being with her, sharpened and created something in me and so suddenly i started to be able to see the secrets of men's hearts and it was an amazing thing i remember we'd be driving down the road sometimes and you know we'd start almost like okay tell us what's going on in that guy's life and we would almost prophesy <laughs> with one another really abusing the gift because we were young and didn't know what you know we didn't know what we we're doing but we were incredibly sharp at that time and uh and I began to think that I was actually called to be a prophet to the nations. Somehow her gift activated something in me and I became incredibly sharp uh, in the prophetic. And still today, I think much of what I do flows out of the prophetic and the things that I was learning in the relationship at that time. Because the prophetic is really the ability to hear God, which really is how everything in faith works, isn't it? We need faith to hear God. And I know Milan's uh, prophetic school has really helped so many of you to also come to hear the Lord because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. And so whatever we do in the kingdom of God, if it's not with faith, if faith isn't there, if we're not hearing God, it's not God doing it and it's not going to last. So, uh, but the point of this was, I'm getting sidetracked. The point of this was that sometimes a person uh, is a gift to us. And uh, the Bible says this, iron sharpens iron, so man can sharpen man. And the Lord is going to bring people into your life uh, and, and has already through our partnership of churches that will actually come and they'll add to your faith and actually grow your faith. Just by being around them, something will happen inside of you. And Paul, the apostle, writes about this to the church in Thessalonica. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, it's on your screen now, he says, Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. It's an amazing thing that Paul knew that if he would get to that church, there was something of Christ in him that would impart Jesus to them and faith would actually be kind of stirred up inside of them so that they would grow in faith, that they would, where there was lack in faith, that their faith would come into maturity and into fullness, and that they would learn to hear God properly and see God properly, and so begin to flow in a greater degree of faith. And so uh, this is a beautiful picture for us, really, of how a person can come and actually supply what's lacking in your faith. And it's really not them. It's Christ in me the hope of glory. It's always going to be Jesus in them and what Jesus has done in them that will actually somehow be imparted to us as we connect with them and spend time with them. And so these people actually become gifts. And this is one of the wonders of how God works is he doesn't just give gifts, but he gives his gifts into people, some people so much that they themselves become a gift 
to his people. And obviously it's never going to be them. It's always going to be Jesus in, in them. Uh, because, but, but that people will actually be a gift is an incredible thing. And so, you know, the Bible speaks about these fivefold gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They are the gift to the church. They're the ones that come in and, and help us and add to our faith. But here's the amazing thing. It's not just these that are gifts. But the Bible says that we each, as members of the body, are to work together. And in that sense, every part of us complements each other part. And so we actually all are a gift to each other. <laughs> the, the, the church, the mystery of the church and how faith works is that I need you and you need me. And only as every single part of the body does its bit, does the body grow and have life. And so the Bible tells us things like the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you or you have no worth because as much as they're different and they have unique uh, grace, they have unique parts that they have to play in the body. Each one is specific and each one is needed. And so the Bible uses this language a lot. And so the context really, and I want you to see this, is that we won't all be able to do the same stuff in the kingdom of God. We have different roles, different functions, different callings. We all have unique outworkings of faith and that faith is needed. Faith to preach a certain way, faith to evangelize, faith to pray for the sick, faith to do administration. Each of these things together works by faith and the kingdom of God grows as every part does its bit. And um, I remember just, you know, trying to realize that as a young Christian, I was taught, and many of you have probably also been taught, that we can do everything that Jesus did. And on one hand, that's true because the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in me. But on another hand, it's not true because he's also called me to play a unique, specific part. In other words, Jesus was the whole package when he was on the earth. But now that he's ascended, he's given gifts to men. And that is gifting that's come to you differently to what he's given me. We have unique functions, much like Jesus had an eye, so the church is given an eye. Jesus had a hands, and so the church is given hands and fingers, and, uh, and each of us is a part of his body now on the earth, because it's no longer me that lives, but it's now Christ in me. It's Jesus demonstrating his kingdom through me. All right, I hope this makes sense, and it's not too theoretical. So, but I remember learning this as a young Christian, and it was a painful lesson for me, because as I said, I always thought that, you know, I could do everything, and um, we were at a time where I'd had, I was very powerfully saved out of drugs, out of the occult, and I I was growing, I was hearing the voice of the Lord, and then I started to break into this time where I actually saw Jesus, where Jesus appeared to me. He called me personally, in a, you know, physically appeared to me and called me to serve him. And so I was in this incredible place of this intense relationship with God, hearing his voice daily, just so in love with him. And then a move of God came through the churches at the time, and um, it was really a move of power. And suddenly, whenever people were prayed for, they would fall over and they'd be lying on the ground and weeping and there'd be a tangible sense of the power of God doing something, which is a very exciting thing to be a part of. And, um, and so what normally happens, someone would preach and there'd be a prayer line that would come out and everyone would stand there. And, and what eventually happened is the guys learned, certain seem, guys seem to have more power than others, which kind of sucked if you weren't one of those power guys or if you were in a, a queue of people that were going to be prayed for by a guy that didn't seem to have that power. And so I, I was often called to come up as a, I was still a fairly young Christian, but I was asked to come and help pray in these prayer lines and people would be standing there like waiting for a touch from Jesus, you know, and I would put my hand on them by faith and I'd be like, Jesus, would you please move on this person? Would you please heal this person? Whatever it was. And I, I, I really started to struggle because all around me, People were praying for and they were being, they were falling over and crying and, you know, tangible senses of God doing something in their hearts. But when I prayed, there was nothing. Like the person would stand there like, mm, and I'd be like, mm. I was even tempted. I, I mean, I, I, I joke about this. I wasn't really, but there was a part of me that was like, I just am so embarrassed that no one's falling over when I pray for them. I don't even want to pray for people because I look so stupid. Like, why don't I have the power that these guys have? And I, it really, turned my, kind of twisted me up in a knot and I was just struggling with this and I, you know, I always got scared to pray for people. I started wondering had I sinned or maybe I'd done something wrong. It was a really traumatic time as a young Christian. And I went to the Lord in prayer and, and the Lord was slow to answer me, but eventually he said this to me. He said, Andrew, I've called you to play a different part in the body. 
when you speak, and I wasn't then preaching, but he said this to me, when you will preach, people will find themselves falling in love with me and they'll want to run into the things that I've got for them. You'll have a different grace and a different anointing. I haven't called you to do this. And I, and that kind of settled it for me, you know. And, and I, realized, I realized that actually, and here's the wisdom of God, if he'd given me the power there, <laughs> I would have become a one-man package. I would have built my whole ministry around, you know, let me preach to you and I'm going to do amazing stuff when I preach and then I'm going to pray for you and you are going to fall down. And I would have become this traveling evangelist that was doing it all. But the Lord had a different plan through my life. God's plan was that you watching this and the churches around the world in 412 would become a priesthood where every single one of you would play your part. And then I would, by, by him not giving me that to me, I learned that I needed to depend on you, that I would never be able to do what he wanted me to do that the church would never become what it was supposed to become unless every single part of us learned to do our bit. And so the Lord was teaching me something there and I'm so grateful for him now because his ways are higher than ours and his wisdom is so much broader than ours. And here's the thing. And so, I, you know, I have since then actually prayed for people that have fallen over and I have even prayed for people that get healed. But these are not the primary ways that God works through me. God has got a different function for me in the body. And as you watch this, he's got a unique function for you. There's something that God wants to do through your life that no one else can do. And you'll, you might never be the full, or you won't be the full package, but you'll be a part of the package that if it's not there, the, the people, the nations will never see the fullness of Jesus. God has chosen to limit himself to use you and my prayer for you as you watch this is that you would find that unique grace that unique thing that he's called you to and flourish in it whatever it is and don't think that's not important because the parts of the body that seem that they're not important are sometimes the most important of all and so really this is a, an amazing mystery um, that God has given us different things to do and, and you know one of the challenges is even in terms of the outworking of our faith he's given us different portions of faith now one of the things I struggle with and I think we should all struggle with is how we build this theology of how we do miracles and um, I want to try and unpack that a little bit and show us that we do need to see miracles today in the church but that how much of the church has gotten there is faulty it's cracked it's not good um, it's not a good uh, ex exegesis which literally is a word which means uh, we're not applying or reading the scriptures the way they should be read and, and let me illustrate a lot of people say, you know, a lot of scriptures say, you know, Jesus said to the disciples, you know, go raise the dead, heal the sick, drive out demons and all these different things, which are things that I believe we should be doing. But but we build them on the wrong scriptures. We build them on the wrong theological premise or the long, wrong understanding. And so, for example, in Mark 10, 1, Jesus called 12 disciples to him. And it says, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So these 12 guys were given a unique calling at a unique time in history. Jesus had come and uh, he was told, you know, the, the Messiah was going to come and reveal himself to Israel. And it was even prophesied that, um, you know, in Isaiah 50, uh, 35, it was prophesied that he would raise the dead, heal the sick and all these, do all these different things. And so when he sent the 12 out to do these things, he was demonstrating to Israel that the Messiah, the kingdom is here. The, the king is here, basically, which is why when John the Baptist started doubting about Jesus, are you the one or should we expect someone else? Jesus said, go and tell John what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. That's exactly out of Isaiah 35. He's literally saying, John, I am the Messiah. And so this was something that Jesus was doing at that time in a nation to a unique group of people. We know a little bit later he did send out, but can I say this? The 12 had a unique role. And when he called the 12 to do this, they were not the only disciples. There were many others that we know were following Jesus, Mary um, and others, but they were not given that role and they weren't given that authority and so most of the gospels you see Jesus or the 12 doing miracles you would say well Andrew what about the 72 because he sent them out too and at one point you know Jesus called he had a whole lot of disciples at this point probably around 72 of them and, and he sent them out and he said to them you know again go drive out demons heal the sick um, and so a lot of guys build their, their beliefs, well, this is something we need to do. But again, I want to say, remind you that this was to the 72 at a specific time, actually at a specific moment. We don't see the 72 after that doing those miracles again. Plus, when Jesus sent the 72 out, he literally said to them, 
only preach to the Jews. Do not preach to the Gentiles. And so well, you realize, hang on, does this mean that miracles are never going to be for the Gentiles? No. Jesus was doing something at that time, at that place, at that moment, through a unique group of people. And so actually, primarily at that point, most of the time, it was really just the 12 that are going to be doing miracles. And this really carried on even into the book of Acts. We read in the Acts uh, 2 verse 43, the amazing this church has been birthed and it's starting to grow and it says everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles and so again right at the birth of the church it's actually primarily the apostles that are doing the miracles we don't actually see anyone else at this point doing miracles but there's a mystery to this because actually this is the church at its infant stage. This is the church at its baby stage. And so the Holy Spirit has just been poured out. And as the church starts to grow, we actually start to see some other people starting to do miracles. Uh, and so now, even though Jesus initially said to the 12 that he'd given them this authority and the 72 had a moment of authority and then it was gone again, um, here you start to see this kind of rising up, almost like the tide starts to change as the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. And by Acts 4, you're starting to see some new people arising and doing miracles. You've got a young man called Philip, the evangelist. He becomes known as the evangelist. He actually becomes a deacon in the church. And suddenly when this guy's praying and doing stuff, there are some incredible miracles breaking out. I would argue some of the things he did were almost greater than some of the things that the 12 did. And so you've suddenly got these new faith gifts emerging and doing things that are really miraculous. And obviously... This is as the church starts to mature. And so as the church starts to grow and mature, you'll start to see the parts of Jesus that actually do move in miracles and signs and wonders and you know, can calm storms and move mountains and those kind of things start to emerge. And actually, primarily, you're going to see them coming through distinctly through individuals that will emerge within the body of Christ and reflect that part of Jesus to the church. Now, I need to make it clear. Don't think that God won't use all of us for miracles because he will it's just that he'll primarily use those guys more than he'll use the rest of us for that specific thing much like he's using me differently to how he's using you that are watching this you might at times also preach like i'm preaching you might encourage you might even go in, in a sense being apostolic but you are called to function uniquely uh, and so don't cap God and say, well, I'm not that, because I think that's that's limiting God by your unbelief. God can do anything through anyone whenever he wants to. But at the same time, there's definitely be some people that will do it more than often, more than others. And so, you know, the Bible speaks about this as gifts or things that the Spirit gives. And in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, we read, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Yeah, you know, it's my firm conviction, and certainly seems like it's Paul's here that if people don't learn to flow in the gifts, the things that God has given them, the church will never function like it's supposed to, because every one of us must play our part for the body of Christ to grow. So you need to know about this. Don't be uninformed about this. There is something that Jesus wants to teach you through the scriptures and by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so he goes on and he says in, in Romans 12, verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each one of us and so <laughs> there's different gifts God gives me something different to what he gives you and it's as he wills it's according to the grace that God gives us in other words it's not something that you earn or deserve God doesn't cause one man to be able to move mountains by faith because he's a more holy man or because he's even more loved by God yeah, you know, God just gives us by grace which means it's never deserved and these are different gifts and, and I was just thinking you know, maybe just to illustrate two different gifts that you most of you should know. I, I was thinking of Merv, who's just an incredible gift in worship. And, you know, so often we, we come into the presence of God as he leads us in worship. And he's got this way of, it's like when he sings, heaven comes to earth, Jesus is there. It's like Jesus speaks to us through his worship. And actually, he's also very prophetic. And so he'll often actually speak the wonders of the Father's heart. And he actually reveals the heart of the Father. It's like he actually brings an, a, it's like a, if, if, a, if a rainbow is many different you know, colors, actually, or sorry, if light is many different colors, sometimes one person will reflect that color. And so miracle often comes to you with the Father heart of God, the kindness of God 
God. That's generally the flow that he moves in, although he is growing and developing in others. But at the same time, while he has that gift, something God's given him, and he's the gift to us. We also have a guy called Phil. He's coming on your screen now. And Phil works administratively, which is also a gift of the Holy Spirit. And if it were not for Phil, you wouldn't actually be able to be watching this. You wouldn't be able to watch Merv because it wouldn't get to you. Because Phil behind the scenes works with a team of people that are gifted by the Holy Spirit with administration. And they are as important as I am, as Merv is. Because together we can reflect Christ and build the body. And so we need each of these gifts. They're all important. Even though they all function by faith, they're all uniquely different. And so that's really there to encourage you. You have a unique space within the body of Christ and we need it to come to fruition. And so let's just zone in on a few. And I specifically want to zone in on the faith kind of gifts, the gifts that seem to move mountains or, you know, miraculous provision or um, <laughs> these are these are things that God gives certain people differently to others. And again, it's by grace. It's by faith. It's as the Spirit has measured out what he's given. It's not because they are more special. But in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 to 31. Let me say this. It's not because they're more special. Because we're all special. God loves you and he loves me. But let's jump in. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 31. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrating, and various kinds of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess the gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, and this is all with a question mark, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, he, he's using a similar stream of things. And when it comes to miracles and gifts of healing, he adds to another by the Spirit, the gift of faith or faith, to another faith by the same Spirit. And so you start to see Paul gives us all these different gifts. And this is not a complete package, but this is kind of some of the big ones that he's giving us. And um, <laughs> yeah, what he's effectively saying is, you're not all apostles, are you? Not like, not like I am, not like and I'm not like an apostle like Paul was. We have a different grace. We could all maybe prophesy to some degree, but we're not all prophets. And then he says, do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? <laughs> do all have the gift of faith? Now, to some degree, yes, you do have a faith gift, but not the gift of faith in that it's a, a, a faith gift that seems to be able to consistently bring faith into the situation, consistently find the ability to actually see what God wants to do and bring it into fruition. Or miracles, for example. You know, I guarantee if you walk with Jesus for some time, you're going to see some miracles because it's he's a miraculous God. Uh, but not all of us will do miracles to the same degree. There's some people that will just seem to have that ability uh, to do things that we can't do, or gifts of healing. It's, it's by the Spirit as He has portioned out. And so the Bible says that we should desire the greater gifts. And so if you're sitting there, you should actually desire the greater gifts. You should, and, and obviously in order of importance, Paul gives us this, you should desire the apostolic, you should desire the prophetic, you should desire to be a teacher or a miracle worker or a gift of healing or, you know, you should desire these things because these things are important and helps and administration are right up there. These are big gifts that actually serve the body. And we need these gifts in the body of Christ. Christ wants these body. And so desire them. Don't just sit there and say, well, I'm just this. Desire the greater gifts. And remember, they're gifts. You're never going to earn them. They're going to come from God. But you can position yourself to that he might give you that gift. Um, and so, you know, ask him. Ask, Lord, please, God, I have that gift. I'm desiring that gift. I would love to see miracles. I would love to see, I'd love to plant churches, which is another gift. I would love to be able to help administrate your kingdom. I would love, Father, give me this gift. And then be faithful with what you are entrusted with. And remember, faithfulness doesn't earn you a better gift. It just means that the Father might see that you're faithful and choose to give you another gift. Uh, there's a difference between being faithful and the Lord saying, well, you've been faithful, I'll give you more, versus earning something. We can never earn anything in the kingdom of God. It's always by faith, always by grace, and received by faith. And so, you know, I was thinking of a faith gift that I know, and probably one of the strongest faith gifts that I know is, uh, and maybe when I say gifts for healing specifically, is a, is a friend of mine, and many of you know him, he's ministered across our field of churches, he's called Jonathan Conrath. 
And Jonathan carries the gift of faith. He is that part of the body of Christ that when he comes, faith rises. I mean, if he's no meaning for 10 minutes, you'll start to suddenly believe that God actually can do miracles. And it's almost as though the scriptures that maybe aren't promised to us suddenly feel like they are because through him, through that gift, Jesus is actually wanting to give faith to us. He's wanting to, to, to impart something to us. And in some ways, again, remember, he is the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but he does different things at different times. When Jonathan comes into the room, we have to believe that God has brought him there. And that Jesus wants to demonstrate his kingdom with signs, wonders, and miracles. And he probably also wants to grow many of you that are watching or in that moment. Because as you listen to that gift, he is adding what's lacking, supplying what's lacking in your faith. And so you start to find something stirring up in you, especially those that carry the gifts of faith that maybe are latent or aren't developed. Suddenly it feels like they're coming alive. They want to hang out with them. Like, please, could you pray for me? Please, Because something in them, the gift inside of them is starting to kind of be woken up and come into fruition. But even Jonathan, I, was, I, had, a, I had a great conversation with him actually earlier and I was just chatting with him about miracles and Jonathan has seen tens of thousands of people miraculously healed I mean I've when it comes to faith for healing I've probably seen I would say honestly less than 10 people that I would say man God did a miracle there by faith and the fact that he did any is amazing but that's not my primary gift I've been in the right place at the right moment but Jonathan will have a much higher hit ratio in this thing because that's what God's given him and I was chatting with him and I just said so Jonathan you know he was telling me how he'd raised the dead prayed for many people to be raised from the dead but only but seen five raised from the dead which is far more than I've seen and he said this as he was chatting with him. I was, I was just chatting with him about this, what I'm sharing with you now. And he said, you know, Andrew, it's interesting. I prayed for many people that weren't healed and weren't raised from the dead. But I can tell you with every one of those five, I distinctly remember as I was praying for them, the gift of faith came upon me and I knew that God wanted to do it. And those are the ones that were healed. And isn't that an incredible picture that even though I might have a gift of faith, unless God gives me that portion that I need in the moment, I'm not going to be able to move in faith. He's going to have a much higher hit ratio on faith healings than I will, because right now that's what God has given him, and God hasn't right now given me that same gift. But at the same time, when I preach, there'll be things that I'll be able to do that he won't be able to do, because God has given me a different faith, a different measure, and a different outworking. And so for each one of us, we have a portion and a unique outworking. But every single thing that we do in the kingdom, ultimately works by faith. And so here I want to finish with this, and I really want to kind of encourage you as you hear this, that, you know, God will bring us gifts, and God has given us gifts. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 11, he's given, you know, these fivefold gifts, and, and normally those gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, when they're there, the other gifts come into fruition. And so as every part of the body rises up, and as we're able to supply what's lacking in the faith within the churches and within your own life, we start to see you and I maturing to become the full man that we call to be in Christ Jesus. And actually Jesus said that we together would do even greater things than he did when he's on the earth. That we would see signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, the gift of faith for uh, or miraculous, in miracles is a gift. Some people do miracles. They'll be able to provide miraculously. When they pray, it's literally heaven and earth seem to move. But it's by the faith coming into them as the Lord uses them to bring about his kingdom. And so desire the greater gifts, seek them. But let's build our understanding of these based upon the proper foundations of Scripture and at a relationship with the Holy Spirit who portions out to us, both in terms of calling, that some are called to this, but also in the moment that you and I, in a moment, could hear the Lord say, this is what I want you to do. And God might use you to raise the dead because the same God that lived, you know, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and God wants his kingdom to come and at times it'll come in greater ways than others but we're living in times where honestly I believe we're going to see and should expect a great outworking of the Holy Spirit because the Bible did promise that in the latter the latter the latter reign would surpass the former and while in a sense since the time of Jesus that reign has been there we are living in the time of miracles we're living in the time when the Holy Spirit has come to the earth he is here living among us he 
is giving gifts and portioning them out to us. He's leading us every single day to be a people of faith. And as a people of faith, we will see mountains move. We will see churches planted. We'll see nations brought to their knees as all of us do our part. We'll see others who have the, a gifting, an anointing from God to make money, to supply, uh, to supply what others can do. So every one of us has a part to play. And every single one of us is important in the plan of God. God has chosen to need you and to use you. And I want to finish and pray for you because we need every single one of these gifts flowing. We need faith flowing across our field of churches, across the nations, so that the people who are living in darkness can see a great light and come to our Savior, bow their knee, and come into the kingdom of our God. And so I'd love to pray with you in closing. Why don't we close our eyes and just bow our heads. And Father, I want to thank you for every single person watching this. I thank you that you have already apportioned out gifts. Father, I know that for many watching this, they haven't learned how to walk in those gifts. They haven't uh, fanned them into flame properly. They haven't uh, yet been fully equipped and enabled. It's like they, they, they've been given a sword, but they don't know how to use it. And I pray for each and every one, Lord, as we continue in these series, as we continue building together, you know, with apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors moving across our field to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. I pray that as that happens, we will see the, this kingdom of priests emerging with every single one of us walking in the fullness of the portion of faith that God has given us, eagerly desiring the greater gifts and even stepping into things beyond that which you've portioned us as we faithfully administer that which you've given us. And my prayer, Father, is that you would anoint us and apportion even greater portions of miracles, of signs, of wonders, of apostles and prophets and evangelists, of teachers, of administrators, of those that can raise finances for the kingdom, uh, of those that can lead us in worship, of those that can... Just, Father, every single one is so important. Mercy gifts, Lord. Those that love the poor and love to be among them serving. Let the body of Christ arise by faith, that a people of faith would emerge and together would reflect Jesus to the nations of the world. And so right now, Father, would you portion out and increase and enlarge our faith. Father, I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And if you've been watching this and you'd love to know Jesus and just come into a relationship with God, He loves you. He wants to, he wants to bring you into His kingdom and His purposes. There's a number coming up on your screen right now. You can get a hold of us. Send a message to that number and we'll contact you and pray with you and introduce you to him so that you can walk with God, know God, and come into the purposes that he has made you for specifically because he loves you and you've got a plan for your life. And maybe if you're just struggling in an area as well, please contact us on this number. Let us know. We'll pray with you. If you've got things that you just trust in God for, just let us know and we'll have guys praying for you. So looking forward to catching up with you in the next one. I think we're nearing the end of the series, but I pray it's been a great blessing to you and it's growing your faith so that we can see the kingdom of our God come by faith. Bless you guys.